Hi, I'm Jonathan, and today we're going to be taking a tour of the sub-basement at, here at Polar Reef. Last week, Andrew and John took you on a behind-the-scenes tour of Polo Reef. Today, we're diving deeper. We're going to take a walkthrough of the sub-basement, and later on, we're going to meet up with Alex the vet, so we can show you some of the equipment he uses. But first, let's check back in with John. This is Jonathan, and today we're going to take a tour of the sub-basement virtually because the noise from all the equipment is very loud down there, and we, you wouldn't be able to hear me. At the base of the stairs, we have a computer screen to our right here, which shows our flow rates, sensor levels, sump levels, temperatures, and all our readouts that we have on multiple screens throughout the house. We immediately also see the sump for the 2500, which is currently up and running with a rotary drum filter, which is more prevalent in the aquaculture industry. The rotary drum filter is our mechanical filtration for the 2500. Water enters on the left side here. It flows into a drum in the inside that has a 60 micron mesh, very similar to filter socks which generally are more like a 200 micron, so this is gonna filter a little finer. As the drum becomes clogged with dirt, the water level on the left-hand side of the filter rises and hits a sensor, which triggers a washing system, which rotates the drum and sprays it with high-pressure RO water. The water is then goes down to a waste pipe, which will eventually be pumped out to the sewer. The water then comes out of the clean side of the drum filter and dumps into the sump and flows through the baffles to break up bubbles and goes up to the pumps where it is then returned and distributed to other parts of the house. Behind the 2500 sump, we have the closed loop pumps for the 17,000. These are two 10 horsepower pumps, one running at a time and capability of switching over automatically if one was to fail. Behind that, we have the new degassing system that we installed for the 17,000, which the water comes from the diatom filter that's behind the stairs, flows through a one micron pre-filter block similar to in an RO, then goes through these 3M gas transfer membranes that separates out the excess nitrogen from the water and returns it back into the sump. Behind these, to the left here, we have the water change tanks. We have a 5,000 gallon water change tank that we use with salt water. That's for the 17,000 primarily. Then we have a 2,000 gallon water change tank that we will be using for the 2,500. And behind that, we have the 2,000 gallon RO storage tank, which we then are, will be using to make salt water as well as what we use to wash the rotary drum filter. On the left-hand side here, we have the return pump, which comes out of here, goes through the chiller, through the UV, and then back up to the, the two separate tanks. We have a refugium section in the center, which we currently aren't using. And all the way to the right, we have six inch by 32 inch filter socks, which is our mechanical filtration here. And then in the corner, we have a very large Bubble King skimmer. Behind this sump is the sump for the 17,000 gallon tank. This sump is 12 feet long, four feet wide, and eight feet deep. Previously, the water entered closer to where we're standing here on the left-hand side of it, but now it enters on the right-hand side as we made modifications to try to work on our gas pressure levels. And we were going to build a degas tower in this area and needed the space to build that but since we've replumbed this and changed the flow of the water, we were able to drop the TGP levels. To understand a bit more about TGP, let's catch up with Andrew as he gets ready to test the 17,000 gallon. So we're about to um, do a test that we have done quite often here at, Sa at uh, Polar Reef. We did see a fish with Popeye yesterday. It was the first one I've seen in a while. And uh, we are gonna test the TGP, which tests the gas. We did install these special 3M membranes downstairs and I wanna see how they're working. Um, we have two of these machines. They're not the most accurate. So we're gonna calibrate both of them to the atmosphere. And then we're gonna put them both in the tank. They're both calibrated. We'll put them in the tank for 20 minutes and um, see what the TGP reading is, the oxygen and the nitrogen. And then I'm gonna switch one of them to the clam tank because 
that's where we think uh, clams possibly could be dying from. So come on up. It's very easy. You calibrate it to the atmosphere and you just stick it in. I like to do them both a little different heights, a little different locations. And then 20 minutes, they tend to stabilize, 20 to 30 minutes. And we'll come back and uh, see what the reading is. And then we'll move it to the tanks that are closer to the system, those two, three hundredths on the clam tank. That's where the TGP tends to be a little higher. I think it just has less room to degas as as it travels through the pipes. And uh, give us 20 minutes and I'll, I'll let you know the readings. Okay guys, we're gonna check out the TGP readings now. Uh, there are different heights and I don't know which one is higher and lower. Let's see, this is the one that's way down at the bottom. And this one, is reading 104 and a half with a residual 106 oxygen at 8 milligrams per liter so it's not terrible so it's mostly residual nitrogen this one is reading 102.6 which is right on that borderline safety decent number so we're here at the clam tank where we've had some issues again with some clams uh, maybe that's just the way they are maybe not I'm not giving up. As I suspected, the total gas pressure is up about one point from the main tank, which I think is just coming from the shorter run from the sump into here versus the longer run into the main tank. Is 103.2 and 104 residual? Is that the problem? Uh, looks like it's only small on the oxygen side, a little bit more on the nitrogen side. So we may need to do some more degassing or take this clam system offline and make it its own separate tank. Either way, we're gonna figure it out. Thank you, Andrew, for the demonstration on how to measure TGP. We look forward to seeing the updates on the clam tank. Let's take it back downstairs with Jonathan to finish the walkthrough of the sub-basement. And with the addition of the gas transfer membranes that have recently come online, we were able to get our TGP numbers into a safe level. On the right-hand side, we have a mezzanine platform where all our pumps sit that return the water back to the tanks. There is three 10 horsepower pumps that supply water to the 17,000 gallon tank, two running and one as a backup, and they rotate every 24 hours so that they wear evenly. And that is the conclusion of the equipment in the sub-basement. At Polo Reef, keeping the fish and corals safe is priority number one. Alex the vet has a big responsibility to keep this true. He uses some high-tech equipment to help him out. Let's head back to the lab to check in with him. Hi, I'm Alex the vet. I'm just going to go through some of the equipment that I use on a day-to-day -day basis here. Uh, first, we have this stereoscope. Essentially, lets me look at the surface of you know, different corals, different flatworms. Um, again, if I'm looking like an external examination of a fish or if I'm doing like a gill biopsy where I need to see quite fine detail. Um, so right now I'm actually looking at some Euphilia flatworms that we've um, dipped this morning. They came off in the dip and now just going through the different species that we have here. Because um, again, most often, you know, people associate one species with, you know, eating Euphilia, but there are a variable, you know, different types of species that consume the same coral. And here we have a regular essential uh, microscope, um, a BA310E. Um, essentially, this allows me to look at organisms that are much, much smaller. So this can only go about 50x or 50 times magnification. This one can do about 2,000. Um, so again, much stronger magnification. This lets me see different bacteria, different protozoa. Um, so when I scrape the fish, you know, I'll look here for external lesions or anything like that. And then I look for bacteria um, and or protozoa with this scope. Um, I like to use a headlamp because then it leaves my hands free to work with whatever I'm working with or if I'm, you know, using some small tools, etc. Again, it gives me both my hands. Again, it looks a little ridiculous, but it's quite functional. For those of you at home, 
you know, you don't need a super high powered microscope. Again, in here, we're looking at certain bacterial infections and trying to identify species of bacteria. At home, you know, most often you're gonna be identifying protozoa, which are much larger. Um, there are microscopes on Amazon that like a hundred bucks um, that can help you see your anema, monogeans, um, even ick. So again, you don't need super high power magnification unless you're trying to identify bacterial species. In terms of a triocular scope or the, this AM scope here, um, you know, a large magnifying glass, you know, can, can help to some degree. Actually, Dunn is using our magnifying glass over there uh, to look at um, Euphilia flatworms and combing through the heads. So again, any like desk magnifying glass always works great. Again, keeps your hands free, lets you look at, you know, it's a fixed objective. So this I can actually control the level of magnification, whereas the desk magnifying glass doesn't allow control. Um, but again, for a budget, it would be my go-to. So it's extremely important for us to identify, you know, the bacterial infections, protozoal infections, because that dictates the treatment. So here we don't like to do something called a shotgun treatment, and that's essentially where medication, you try to wipe everything out. Here we like to tailor each treatment to the infection that we're treating. Again, that reduces the likelihood of re resistance, and it also increases the likelihood of success um, in terms of getting a complete cure. So we always want to know you know, down to the species level, what we're treating and why we're treating it. Uh, sometimes we even send out bacterial cultures that get sent to the lab, um, that then the lab then grows the bacteria and then tests different medications to that bacteria so we know what um, medication to use and what it's most susceptible to, rather than trying to guess and then possibly creating resistance, or the bacteria is already resistant to the medication we're trying to use. Um, so culture is also a really big key that we use here. Just got in this Madagascar flasher and this jewel rest, kind of give them a quick scrape, see if there's any external parasites. We don't like to immediately medicate these species because they tend to be quite sensitive. So again, if I don't find anything immediately, then they'll go in like a separate quarantine with no meds, and then I'll scrape them again, see if we find any parasitism, you know, in the next couple of days. But again, they don't just immediately get into meds. They're quite fragile, so I can't squeeze them too hard. Just gently scrape the sides of them, making sure to get both sides. So you can see the little bit of mucus on there, a little bit of scales, and then that I'll look under the microscope. This piece, again, these are fragile species. I'll cover the top and they like to jump as we can see. So right now, first I do the low power objective. If we finally see any monogenes or fluke, I'll scan through the entire slide. And I go to the medium power objective, with just a little higher magnification. Okay, now we'll do the other one. So I tend to cover the face with my hand then open my hand like this. So I can just scrape along the body. I got one side. Now I'll flip them over and do the other side. Then nice scale layer. Go back to the low power objective and then do the same process over again. Now these guys will go back into the quarantine that they were living in. And then about a week or so, we'll scrape again. And again, if they show any clinical signs or any of them die, then we scrape immediately. But until then, we try to keep it like a low stress environment. Sam, these guys tend to be quite fragile. Just another day.